I don't always know how many people have heard a teaching anymore because we put everything on the internet. There's nothing new anymore. As soon as it's done, it's no longer hot off the press. It's in the cybersphere. There's never anything new and there's never anything old. It's just there. Now, um, it's unless you're doing something for the first time, it's almost impossible to have a new teaching because it's not new as soon as you do it. Um, even once or twice. Uh, so that puts us in a bit of a predicament. Uh, there's a number of subjects that we can look at. Our problem is, because of what happened medically, I'm unable to do a Q&A time, question and answer time today. You just won't have the time to do it. But I don't like to leave people high and dry. So I've decided to do something I don't usually do. I'm going to let you choose the subject. <laughs> or the text. You can choose anything you want to do. Just don't ask me to do a Greek exegesis of Revelation 17 or something. Because I don't have the Greek Bible with it. But if you choose a subject or a text, we'll see if we can do it. It's open. What would you like me to speak about? Yes, John. Focus on repentance. Focus on repentance. You, sir? Ezekiel 38. Uh, Gog and Magog? Yes. Okay. The focus on repentance. Let's look at the first charisma. There are three kinds of preaching in the New Testament. Three kinds. Okay, three kinds. Charigma. Charigma is evangelism, preaching the gospel. Charismatic preaching. Greek charigma. The first charigma is the day of Pentecost, Peter's sermon. Second. The day scheme. Like didactic, expounding doctrine, expounding doctrine, teaching doctrine. Third, familia, where you get the word homily, homily. An elder or a pastor must be able to teach, meaning he must be able to give a homily, an exhortation. What is the difference? The daskin is the doctrine. Homily is teaching the sheep how to practically apply it in their lives, you understand? What we did in the first session was the dasking. Okay. But when a pastor gives an exhortation, it's a homily. There are people who can do dasking, but who are not pastors. <clears throat> a pastor may be able to do dasking, but if he cannot at least familia, 
he cannot be a pastor. Does anybody know my friend Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum? Arnold Kandidaskin. He cannot homelia. There are other people who can homelia. They do not the daskin. But then we have the kerygma. Those who preach the gospel. Not every Christian is an evangelist. But every Christian is a witness. I will make you fishers of men. What am I saying? What does the scripture mean? There's a difference between fishing with a net and fishing with a pole or a rod. An evangelist will be able to stand up and preach the gospel to a larger number of people. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody has the gift of evangelism. <laughs> the capacity to charisma. But while not every Christian is an evangelist, every Christian is a witness. No, we cannot all fish with a net. But every one of us is called to be able to fish with a rod, a pole. There's nobody who cannot give their testimony, hand somebody a track, knock on a door, invite somebody to church, witness to somebody one-on-one. -on -one. We are all called to fish with a pole. Evangelists or called to fish with a net. Does everybody understand the difference? Now there's a big problem. It shouldn't be there, but it is. In the Great Commission, Jesus never said to make converts. <coughs> As we see in the parable of the sower and the seed in Matthew 13, converts fall away. He said to make disciples. Can an obstetrician say, that's it, the baby's born, it's all finished. No. Obstetrician says, my role is finished. Now the baby needs a neonatologist, a pediatrician. <clears throat> Evangelism minus discipleship. Evangelistic ministry minus pastoral ministry equals zero. You hear what I said? Jesus never said to make converts. I had a friend who used to preach in this country, among others. He was my friend. And he was kind of a conspiracy theorist guy, unfortunately, <laughs> but he preached the gospel. And people were saved from it. I said to this friend of mine, Look, brother, you're speaking in these crazy churches. Jesus never said to make converts. To make disciples. He says, The Lord has just told me to preach the gospel. Okay, maybe he's just told you to preach the gospel. But what do you do with the baby after it's born? What do you do with someone after they're born again? You're putting him into these crazy churches. And he wouldn't listen. Well, there's people in his family who agreed with me, but he wouldn't listen. He wanted to have a platform. 
in big churches, and he had it. He also had a daughter who had a tropical disease that was dormant in her metabolism. But when his daughter's husband died, leaving her and a baby, she went into clinical depression, and the clinical depression was one of the factors that triggered a reactivation of this dormant virus. <clears throat> and she was going to this lonely church. And this lonely churches were telling her, just claim the healing. Believe God for it. And when it didn't happen, they put her under condemnation. You don't have any faith. Then he had this other guy he hung out with. And his wife, and they were a pair of wackos. They had a magazine. Now, don't get me wrong. I am 110% against non-therapeutic abortion, obviously. I believe it will bring the judgment of God on the societies that have done it. And I like babies, children, and grandchildren. Lord's first command was go forth and multiply. But these people had a ministry going around and telling people to have as many babies as possible, to populate heaven and bring them up Christian. Now the scripture they, they take certain verses and certain passages and that was their ministry. And they were convinced the scripture forbade birth control for married Christian couples. And I said to them, you know what verse I'm talking about. That's talking about Leverite marriage. When a brother dies, leaving a widow, there had to be a perpetuation of what we call in Hebrew, Yerusha, the inheritance, redeeming the name of the deceased brother. You see this in the book of Ruth. Mm -hmm. And a Jew had to have another Jew come after him, in other words, to redeem his name. It's a pick type of Christ, you understand. Jews who died in the Old Testament, faithful under the law, needed the Messiah to come. It's a shadow of Christ. But it had a practical meaning of perpetuating the Yerusha, the inheritance from the apportionment of Joshua by tribes, families, and so forth. A family could not permanently lose its land. If it lost its land through debt, it would have to be repatriated in the year of Jubilee. The person whom they owed the money could make use of the land agriculturally to reclaim their money, but in the year of Jubilee, and shall now you have the money, had to go back. This is a big deal. And Yerusha was especially important in certain tribes, particularly the tribe of Judah, to know who the king was, the descendant of David, and ultimately the Messiah, and the tribe of Levi to know who the high priest would be. It was really important to keep this so you had Leverite marriage. Honor thy father and mother. The Hebrew word is kavod from the word kaved, to be heavy. What that primarily means, it's not just honor as we think, it, it's more like honorarium, money. It means the same as your parents were financially responsible for you in your pediatric years, should the need arise, you are responsible for them in your geriatric years, and if you're not, don't expect much longevity yourself. Even the New Testament says this, it's a commandment with a promise. And Jesus condemned the Pharisees, anything that be given to my parents is korban given to God. This was a big deal. Okay, honor your parents. <laughs> like in much of Africa today, your children are your pension. <laughs> There's no social security or 
superannuation, retirement benefits, insurance. Children take care of you and travel Africa when you're old. That's why people in Africa will have 10 kids, even despite the high infant mortality. Hopefully five of them will be living to, be, to look after them. It's like this in tribal Africa, among other places. Certainly in Africa. So I said to him, where it says this, the only form of birth control that existed in the ancient world, obviously, was coitus interruptus. Sorry to be gross, extravaginal ejaculation. But it was only forbidden in the case of Leverite marriage. You were not to use your brother's widow as a sex object. You were not to reduce her to a concubine for sexual entertainment. You were to procreate children on behalf of your deceased brother for the Yerusha and for her provision in her old age. That was the only case where birth control was forbidden. He took this thing out of context and made a whole doctrine of it. Not based on exegesis or what the text said or what it meant. This is just something he cooked up in his mind with his wife. A pair of crackpots. And I know a woman in New Zealand who had six children, I believe, but she had serious hemorrhaging in the delivery of the previous child that required cesarean section, but there was post-surgical hemorrhage. She was told by obstetric and gynecological opinion, you were at high risk having other children. We wish to do a fallopian procedure to prevent future pregnancy. If you want any future children, you should consider adoption, but you should not have any more children. Because you don't want the children you have to lose their mommy. These nuts, these crackpots, told her to just trust the Lord. Claiming to be speaking from Scripture, which they were not. I know a similar such case in Israel, where some believers, the Jewish believer, came under this teaching, and the little kids were left without their mummy. Ever see a four-year-old cry at his mother's grave? Because it is religious nuts! Oh, how can you be so judgmental? Or how can you be so stupid? That woman shouldn't have died. Those little kids shouldn't be without their mother. Because of some crackpot, some religious freak. Twisting the word of God to say things it doesn't mean. Because that's their ministry. Well, anyway, this evangelist who was speaking in these places with his daughter who had this condition. Tragedy struck the family when her husband was killed in a scuba diving accident. I knew him. She had a nice baby. I was there the week the baby was born. She was into this depression. She's physically ill. And she goes to one of this nut job churches, just claim the healing word faith church. <laughs> When she doesn't get healed, they put her under condemnation. True story. You don't have any faith. She hung herself. Her father, she's the daughter of a prominent evangelist. She hung herself. Now do you see why I told you not to put people in these churches, your own daughter's dead because of it. She shouldn't be dead, she should be alive. 
I took no pleasure. But I was angry. See, my thing is correct, but my thing is also the Daskin country. I'm not very pastoral, <laughs> if you haven't noticed. <laughs> True story. Greatly so. Let it be a warning to others. Jesus never said to make converts, he said make disciples. The first step of biblical discipleship <clears throat> is believer's baptism. <clears throat> one of the worst things you can do, one of the worst things any preacher can do, one of the worst things any church can do, is to sprinkle an infant and tell that family the kid is a Christian, the baby is a Christian when they aren't. God has no grandchildren. First Corinthians 7. God does make a distinction between the children of believers and the children of non-believers. That is true. But they still much must reach an age where they decide to accept Christ for themselves under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and become born again, then baptize him. We are baptized into his death. Who in their right mind would take a little baby out of a pram and put it into a casket and bury it if it wasn't deceased? <clears throat> Believer's baptism is the first step of discipleship. The old man is buried with Christ. When I was a teenager, I was a communist. And I was a cocaine addict. Not proud of it, but that's what I did, and that's what I was. But Jesus saved me. I'm not a recovering cocaine addict on a 12-step program. I'm a new creation in Christ. That loser mm -hmm. is dead. <clears throat> and he died on the cross of my place. My old man died with it. Am I perfect? No. But thank God you didn't know me before I was saved. What do you do with a corpse? Buried. Find me believer's baptism in an alpha course and I'll give you a thousand U.S. dollars right now. Alpha courses can't make disciples. They tell people to stay in the Roman church and continue praying to the dead. Continue to believe another gospel that says you have to atone for your own sin in purgatory well, the real mm -hmm. gospel is the blood of Christ under some all sin. Mm -hmm. Our Jesus, the real one, said, if anybody tells you I've come back physically, don't believe it. I'm coming back the way I left in the Mount of Olives. But every time there's a mass, the priest with his hocus pocus says in Latin, hoc es corpus meo. They believe that Christ returns physically under the appearances of bread and wine based on Aristotle's debunked philosophy and misunderstanding of physics and chemistry. They said that that's Jesus. They call it the Blessed Sacrament and they pray to it. They worship it. Do we have any former Roman Catholics here? Am I telling the truth? Alpha says stay in the Roman Church. You believe it's his actual blood and not a memorial? What he said was this is my blood poured out. Do this in remembrance of me. It's a memorial. Oh no, that's his blood! Then why are you drinking it? Acts 15, outlaws, cannibalism, and vampire religion. 
The apostle said, don't drink blood. If it is his blood, why are you drinking it? That's no problem for Nicky Gumbel or Alpha Courses. You don't repent of the cannibalism and idolatry of the Mass. You continue with it. Oh, well, we have to tell them to stay in the Catholic Church to reach Catholics. Do you really think that somebody in the Catholic Church is saying, that priest can't forgive your sins, you've got to be born again? That's not really Jesus up there. It's a memorial. I'm doing that. Would you tell an alcoholic to keep drinking so he can reach other drunks <laughs> after he gets saved? Would you tell a prostitute to keep turning tricks, walking the streets, so she can reach other hookers after she got saved? Of course we wouldn't! Tell somebody to continue in the sins of necromancy, cannibalism, and idolatry after they become Christians? Alpha Courses says yes. There's no repentance. At best, there's conversion. And that may even be a false one. But there's no discipleship because there's no repentance. Don't worry about burying the corpse. <clears throat> Just get them saved. Just count the numbers. Or at best, count the baptisms. And then pick up your cross and follow me. We repent when we get saved. But repentance is a lifestyle. Pick up the cross, continually crucify the old nature. Otherwise I'd still be smoking cigarettes and cannabis and taking cocaine and sleeping around. But I got this cross I carry, you see. Now I drop it a lot of times. But I trust him for the grace to pick it up and keep following him when I drop it. I ask him to forgive me. And he does. I don't want to take his grace for granted. But we all drop it. Repentance. In the purpose-driven lie, the purpose-driven liar writes thus. I quote him almost verbatim. It was page 385-386 in the American edition. <laughs> what he says. When you see someone, a non-believer, involved in substance abuse and living immorally, don't tell them to repent. That's a negative message. We have to be seeker friendly. Rather just tell them they need Jesus in their life. Then after he comes into their life, he'll clean them up. The first charisma is the day of Pentecost. Every other charisma in the book of Acts and all of the great evangelists throughout history, all the great preachers, George Whitfield, John Wesley, Charles Spurgeon, D.L. Moody, etc. <laughs> followed the principles expressed in Peter's charisma under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what did Peter say? On the day of Pentecost, Peter said, Repent and be baptized. Repent! No, Rick Warren! Don't tell them not to repent. Just say, Jesus, come into my life. Then he'll clean them up. 
If they don't repent, Jesus isn't coming into their life. It is a false gospel. Let me explain. Past. Present. Future. Salvation is past, present, and future. We were saved. We are being saved. We shall be saved. We were saved. We were justified. We are being saved. The old man and the old woman is being crucified daily. I'm walking in a new life. We are being correct, sanctified. Lift up your head, your redemption draws near. We shall be redeemed. The redemption draws near. Just get Jesus in their life and he'll clean them up. What is Mr. Warren doing? He's confusing justification with sanctification. You understand? He's confusing justification with sanctification. Now, when ordinary people don't get this, they need to have it explained to them. But when pastors don't understand this, they have no business being pastors. They don't understand the basic gospel. They have no right to be pastors. There must be a repentance. Repentance in Hebrew, teshuvah, teshuvah. From the Hebrew shuv, to turn or return. Repentance is not contrition or being contrite for what we did. It will involve that, but that's not what it is. It's teshuvah. Turning away from sin towards God. For the non-believer who gets saved. Returning towards God for the believer who sins. Teshuvah! One of the main things that sparked the Reformation <clears throat> was when Martin Luther learned from the French humanist Lefebvre the meaning of repentance in Greek Metanoia The Catholic Church bamboozled people into thinking it was their sacrament of penance 
where you go kneel down and confess your sins to a pedophile. <laughs> and he tells you to say three Hail Marys. When Luther found out the meaning of repentance was to turn from sin towards God, to be regenerate, he realized the whole Roman Catholic Bill of Goods was, and to this day remains, a filthy pack of satanic lies. Everybody understand repentance? An act of contrition. We can be contrite. Psalm 51, David was quite contrite. But the penitential Psalm 51 is not well translated in most English translations of the scripture. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord. Lev tohor brali Elohim. Lev tohor brali Elohim. Let me explain. You like Greek and Hebrew? Hebrew Tahor Tahor Greek Basically Catharsis First of all, create in me. It's something God must do. We have to respond to it. But he initiates it. But it is not clean. The water is pure. What does pure mean in Greek and in Hebrew? No mixture. No mixture. Not some of it's good and some of it isn't. Let's hypothetically take a young couple, Jack and Jill. Suppose Jack and Jill fall in love and get engaged. And they're genuinely in love. And he genuinely cares about her. It's genuine. It's not some chick he picked up in a pub or a discotheque or a nightclub. He really is committed to loving her and being with her and taking care of her. It's actual romance. It's not just sexual. It's real. You really are in love. He really does care about you. But during their engagement, they have a nice candlelight dinner down by the harbor side in George. <laughs> and it was a romantic evening. They were holding hands like young lovers do. I used to be younger than love. Now I'm just young. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, suppose they get carried away. They kiss goodnight. We get married in June, but it's only February. Becomes more than a kiss goodnight. 
things become impassioned and become physical. Now, in the context of holy matrimony, that is a good thing. But outside of the context of holy matrimony, he's not loving her, and she's not being loved. She's being defiled, violated. But the reason she fell into consenting to it and the reason he tried to seduce her successfully in consenting to it was because they actually were in love. It was not just some lust thing. If you meet someone in a discotheque and sleep with them, that's the lust thing. Giraffes do it. But if you bond with someone, physically, spiritually, and emotionally, mm -hmm. population, that's different. And we really love that. He really did plan to marry her. It wasn't whoredom, per se. <coughs> it wasn't just somebody he picked up. It wasn't just some guy she met and fancied. But it's still fornication. Why? We really are in love. There you are. But there was a mixture. You understand? There was a mixture of what is right and what is wrong. Under other circumstances, it would be totally pure. There would be no mixture once you make a vow to God. A matrimony. It's a mixture. God hates mixtures. He told the church of Laodicea, hot or cold, but lukewarm, he spits it out. Hmm. I've been to Laodicea many times. You got the hot springs coming down from Pamukla, you got the cold springs, but with the two mix, the water's lukewarm to this day. Look with me, please, to Second Peter chapter two. Verse one. False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Notice how Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uses the terms false prophet and false teacher interchangeably, as if they were synonyms. One prophesies falsely, and one teaches falsely. But he uses them as synonyms. Why? If somebody's doctrines are wrong, their prophecies will be wrong. You got it over here. I don't say he has bad intention, but he's biblically ignorant. And he predicts things that don't happen. Your anger's booking it. Why are his prophecies wrong about revival and all? His doctrine is wrong. Now again, I'm not judging his motives. It's not for me to do.
But you have ones who are sinister in their motivation. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Para Sogzusiv. Para is the Greek prefix meaning next to paramedic, paralegal, paramilitary, whatever. Para Sogzusiv. The way false teachers work is they put truth next to error. Satan is too crooked to tell you a direct lie. Too clever. He comes as an angel of light, and so do his servants, we're told in 2 Corinthians, and they operate the way he does. Look at Job's friends. Most of what they said was true. <laughs> but the true things they said were camouflage for the error. Arasun Yes, it's good mineral water. And just a few drops of arsenic. Are you thirsty? Well, it's mostly good. <laughs> you understand? That's the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the Mormons, that's the Roman Church, that's the word faith, that's the New Apostolic Reformation. <laughs> they say a lot of true things. We shouldn't judge, we shouldn't criticize. If the Word of God says something is wrong, that's not you judging and that's not you criticizing. That's what God says. He commands we be discerning. He doesn't advise it, he commands it. Well, there's true things in the purpose driven life. Of course there is. Well, there's true things in Alpha Courses. Of course there is. There's even some true things in the Koran. Para so Zusit. It's a homogeneous or homogeneous solution. When it's parasozusin, you cannot eat the bones and spit out the meat, or spit out the bones and eat the meat. I'm just going to swallow the H2O. I'll spit out the arsenic. Yeah, good luck. You're sure going to need it. <laughs> It must be repented of. When you leave a false religion or a cult, it all goes. Remember King Saul? What's this bleeding of the sheep? Asked Samuel. Well, I tried to keep the good stuff. The good stuff is only camouflage for the poison. There must be repentance. When you repent, you get rid of all of it. Stick to the word of God. Repent, the kingdom is at hand, said John the Baptist. Jesus said, 
repent. I say to you, unless you repent, you too will perish. Peter says, repent and be baptized. Repent. Turn away from it. Don't look to keep the good bits. Jack and Jill really were in love. But they fell into fornication anyway. New Testament tells you. God understands very well about these three substances that young people think with. Testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. God knows all about it. In fact, he invented it. It was his idea <laughs> to begin with. He understands that. And he understands temptation in the world, and the sexually charged society, and media, and the advertising industry, and the fashion industry, and pop music industry. All of these things draw on sexual imagery to try to get money out of people. That's what they all do with all these industries. Do that. All of it. You understand the people who've been saved out of things like prostitution or pornography. They'll tell you it's not about sex, it's about money. <laughs> They'll tell you that. I've known people who got saved out of that kind of background in New York, and they tell you it wasn't about sex, it was about money. So, the Word of God says, if you're young and in love and you are <coughs> being tempted in that particular way, which is entirely natural and certainly understandable in the harmonosphere of this fallen world as it is now, especially in the age of media and so forth, get married! Move the wedding date forward if you're really in love. <coughs> Then it will be Tahor. Then there won't be any arsenic. No water. <coughs> Repent. But they've left repentance out of the equation. If you see an unbeliever living immorally and involved in substance abuse, don't tell them to repent. Well, it so happened I was living with my girlfriend immorally across the street from the United Nations in Manhattan and I was strung out on drugs. And the first thing that the leader of Jews for Jesus in New York told me in those days was get married or get out. So I did the only decent, reasonable thing I could do. I was hurting it out. But anyway. <laughs> I took the rest of my drugs and I threw them out the window, 20 stories down. And as I held people, it's a good thing the Polish ambassador to the UN had diplomatic immunity. <laughs> you stop living that way. If you don't stop living that way, you're not saved. You make Teshuvah. You turn from it back towards God. Does that mean I don't mess up, my friends? I have messed up more times than I can count. Oh, I've never slept with anybody but my wife since she's been my wife, but I've been tempted and I have never taken an illegal drug since I became a Christian. But I've been tempted. Not, not recent years, but certainly as a young believer, yes! Why didn't I? Because the old man was dead. 
Oh, I've made other mistakes and done other things. I dropped the cross, yes. But at least I've got one to carry. Someday I'll exchange it for a crown. It's old and it's rugged, but it keeps me on the right road and off the wrong one. What goes on today, you don't see repentance. Let's look at just one example, Hillsong. Popular all over the world. In Sydney, Australia. Exposed in major financial scandals on Australian TV, believers who were in it came out and said it was financially unscrupulous. I had a couple of musicians came to one of my meetings in Sydney, bigger meeting than this, but they had been the previous week they quit Darling Checks backup band. And they said it's all about business, about money. When the Pope came to Sydney, she said, this is our chance to serve the Roman Catholic Church. That was Darlene Check. But anyway, let's look at Hillsong. The patriarch of Hillsong was Frank Houston, a homosexual pedophile, who his son Brian knew was that and protected him and got in trouble with the police. I knew Pentecostal preachers, old-time Pentecostals, who knew him in New Zealand 40, 50 years ago and said he was always that, but they couldn't prove it. That's the patriarch. <laughs> then there was the second one, at least he liked girls, Pat Masidi. Then there was Bobby Houston's series, Christian Women Love Sex. That's what it was. 13, 14 year old adolescent girls into this Christian women love sex thing. <laughs> now when you look at the Song of Solomon, which has a typological meaning of Christ in the church and so forth, but yes, it's erotic poetry about marital romance and intimacy, it absolutely is, but look what it says. Anita do diva do di li. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. In God's model of marital romance, Christian women love the Lord, they love their husband, and they love babies. How do we get one? Sexuality was the means to love. It was not the object of the love. It is the world that replaces loving the person with loving the act. That is Hollywood. Christian women love the Lord. They love their husbands and they love babies. The little song is teaching teenage girls, young teenagers, Christian of sex. Then they had their women's conference in New York with Carl Lynn's, the Hillsong Women's Conference. Watch it on YouTube. They've got Jesus coming out in female drag dressed as the American Statue of Liberty. I was born right near the Statue of Liberty, three miles from it. And instead of the crown of thorns, he's got the crown of the Statue of Liberty and he comes out. And they begin singing the Frank Sinatra song, New York, New York to Jesus. This was their worship session. It was their finale. And then it was all choreographed with pyrotechnics. Watch this on YouTube. <laughs> They've got the naked cowboy. Some guy with a pair of cowboy boots a 10-gallon cowboy hat and a guitar. That's it. That was the worship at the Hillsong Women's Conference. Blasphemy and promiscuity. Corrupting the youth with unbiblical ideas of romance and sexuality and marriage. It's the world. 
but from the people who left it? Just like any other sex industry, it's an industry. It's about money! <clears throat> there could never be a revival unless we repent of that. You understand? Unless the church repents of this filth, there can be no revival! I remember during the Latin drunken counterfeit revival. The book of Acts says, repent that times of refreshing will come. They said this is the refreshing before the repentance. You put your right foot into your left boot, and your left foot into your right boot, and you walk around like Charlie Chaplin. This was their Toronto and Pensacola. The refreshing precedes the repentance. No, the book of Acts says the repentance precedes the refreshing. There cannot possibly be any revival unless there is a repentance from this garbage, this trash. Revival is impossible. It doesn't matter how much hype is generated in stadiums by A Uncle Angus over here. Revival's not coming. It's not coming. Civil war might be coming, but revival's not coming. Not without a repentance. Now, if there is repentance, the Lord is very gracious. He is unbelievably forgiving. God is so powerful, he can do anything. Even give himself a case of amnesia in regard to our sin. I will remember your sins no more. He's so powerful, he can even make himself deliberately forget. We're going to meet him someday face to face and give account. Do you want him to forget your sins? What are you talking about? I don't remember this. Do you want the Lord God to forget all the wrong things that you ever did? <coughs> I sure want him to forget the wrong things I ever did. He says, all right, I'm going to forget about it. Not in New York, forget about it. Forget about it, no. Literally forget about it. Blot it out of the book of the deeds that it will never be remembered. There'll be no eternal record of it ever having happened. Because of the blood of his son, that's a great deal, isn't it? Mm. That's a great deal. Imagine being in debt forty million dollars and then it, 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 forget about it. We have no record of this. Only it's much more than that. It's too good of a deal to turn down. If you understand the real gospel, it's far too good of a deal to turn down. It's unbelievably good as a bargain. There's nothing like it. God becomes a man to pick up the tab to pay the price for what we did. He takes our sin to give us his righteousness. That he forgets, literally causes himself to forget our sin ever happened for the sake of his son. You turn that deal down, you must be out of your mind. You must be out of your mind. Where do I sign up? 
you sign up by repenting. Not just being sorry. It may involve that. You sign up by asking him for the grace and power to turn from it. He delivered me from cocaine. Cocaine! You know how powerful that drug is? Tobacco and cannabis on top of it. You can deliver me, you can deliver anybody. I didn't have the power or the desire to stop taking illegal drugs. In and of myself, I had neither the power nor the desire. To me, it was not what society said, you've got a drug problem. No, I had a sin problem. It was a lifestyle choice to me. You understand? I couldn't stop doing it because I didn't want to stop doing it. Until he empowered me and gave me new desires. He died my death. But he didn't just say, I'm going to die for you on this cross. He said, pick up your own and die with me. As I rose, I will raise you up or rapture you. You don't need this stuff. You need me. I had no power or desire to stop living that way. None! He initiated. He did it. Left of war, Rally, Elohim. Techadesh, Ruach, Petuki. Ruach Hadash, a new spirit. Ruach Nahon, a right spirit. How does this happen? Simple. Repentance. Turn from sin towards God. Somebody has got to pay that tab. Given the fact that Jesus has already said he's picked it up for you. Why do you want to say no thanks, I'm going to keep my sin. I'm going to keep my tab. And I will pay forever and ever in the pit of hell. That's crazy. But the world is crazy. They're all nuts. Unsafe people are out of their mind. And we were no different. Certainly no better. One condition. Repent. I can't stop doing it. I know you can't. That's why I have to give you the power. You think my arm is so short it cannot save? That doesn't just mean justified. It means sanctified. He's saving us. We've been saved. We are being saved. And we shall be saved. That process, that gift, that incredible, unbelievable deal, the best bargain beyond human conception, far too good to turn down. Has one required? Repentance. <laughs> You want him to forgive you, we have to ask him for the grace to forgive others. I'll forgive you if you trust me for the grace to forgive them. I can't forgive them for what they did. I know you can't. <laughs> but I can forgive you for what you did. And I can give you the grace to forgive them for what they did. 
repent, believe that is repentance do not believe the mixtures do not believe alpha or purpose driven do not believe cheap grace grace is free but it is not cheap it cost God everything when he gave the son an out place. Remember, Jesus didn't just die for all of us. Although that is true, there's much more to it. He died for each of us. In other words, if you or I were the only person who ever sinned against God, we're not, but even if we were, he would have become a man and went to the cross just for you or just for me. He didn't die for all of us alone. He died for each of us. That is his love. That is the love of the Father. I'd like to invite you to accept Jesus into your heart. <laughs> No, 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 no. God commands men to repent. God commands it. It's a fantastic deal. Don't turn it down. And don't tell any non-believer any other gospel. Thank you for the support. Gog and Magog is next time. <laughs> <laughs>